you. Point number one, reason is incredibly important. I am not at all arguing you should be completely emotional, but what I am saying is just as important as rationality is dealing with emotionality. How do you do that when it is so complicated? My suggestion, turn your attention to five simple core concerns. The next time you get into a fight with your spouse, or right before you go into your next big business negotiation, walk through these five core concerns. How do I better respect the other's autonomy? How do I better respect their status, their affiliation, help invite them into a more fulfilling role? And most important, how do I express appreciation most effectively? So with that, let me just say it is a tremendous honor and a true privilege and, pr privilege and pleasure to have this opportunity to talk with all of you. I am terrible with goodbyes, so let me hope that this is just a beginning. Please keep in touch, it's truly an honor. Thank you so very much. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Being here for just a portion of your time so far, there's been a lot of insight, a lot of focus on how you deal with technology. Utilize technology in the retail world. The question we're gonna be focusing on today is how do you deal with the human side of retail? How do you deal with the human side? Just a show of hands, how many of you in this room negotiate on a daily basis? How many of you negotiate on a daily basis? And, you know, and, and I dare say that some people have all the time. And you're with the public sector, with the government. And just as true, you are negotiating inside your organization. You're negotiating at the leadership levels, management issues, strategy, big strategy, and you are also negotiating with your employees. Are your employees happy? Are they loyal to the organization or are they walking off to your competitor's organization because they don't feel happy? They don't feel fulfilled within the organization. And so the question are not with my colleagues, but with my cute little kids at home, you know, who yeah. use every single strategy that the book ever proposes and more, you know. Uh, everything we're gonna be talking about today, yes, it is absolutely useful in the business context, but it is equally useful when you are dealing with a tough spouse, some difficult kids, an aging parent, and so on. So what's the question? The question of how do you deal with emotions? How should you deal with your own emotions? And how do you deal with the emotions of the other side? And this is not an easy question. You know, let's say just for a moment, what well, your first name is? Uh, Joel. Uh, Joel. So um, what are we negotiating? You and me, let's negotiate something. Simple. This is a very good book. <laughs> 20 bucks. For free, I'm not negotiating with you. Yes. 20 bucks? Let me help. The amount of good ideas in there, it will save you an extraordinary amount of money. I'm willing to sell you this thing for 100 bucks right now. Signed, if you care. <laughs> 50. 50. He's already up to 50. I might say yes. But here we are in a negotiation. You know, who is it? And we get into a negotiation. Emotions are there. You know, emotions are always in our negotiations. Often, as you negotiate, how should people deal with emotions? Often, what do you think the first response is when I ask this question around the world? How should you deal with emotions in your business negotiations? What do you think people say? That's don't get emotional. You know? As the two of us are negotiating, I'm supposed to be this rational robot that you know we all are in the retail world. Come on, that's not real. So how do you deal with emotions as you are negotiating with somebody else? And then the psychologists come into the picture. And the psychologists say, you know how you should deal with emotions? Deal directly with every single emotion that comes up. Know what you're feeling, know what your supplier is feeling, and deal with those emotions. The problem here is that there are hundreds of different possible emotions. You know, as, as we are negotiating right here, there might be feelings of shame or humiliation, curiosity, pride, untapped love, I just want you to love me, you know? 
How do you deal with all of those different emotions as you are negotiating online with another party? And I would argue that it is overwhelming to do. Too many emotions, too many causes of those emotions, too many things that you can do. And so for you in the retail world, this puts you into a problem. Because on the one hand, you cannot ignore these things called emotions. They're a part of who we are. And yet at the same time, these things are way too complicated to try to deal with each and every one as you are negotiating with a supplier, as an example. So what do you do? And my colleague Roger Fisher and I, we were stumped, puzzled by this question. And ultimately we came to the conclusion, how should you deal with emotions as you are negotiating? Don't. Don't focus on each and every emotion that comes up in that human interaction. Instead, turn your attention one step back to a handful of things that we call core concerns. Matters that are important to each and every one of us in this room. Matters that are important to every supplier that you will work with. Autonomy is important to us. We want to feel affiliated, connected, and so on. And so the purpose of our time this afternoon is for me to walk through, for all of us to walk through, what are these five core concerns, and how can you practically utilize them as you are negotiating on the job? And the big idea, if you deal effectively with these five core concerns, you stimulate positive emotions. You get people who want to work with you. People who are more likely to share information with you. People who are more loyal to you. People who are more loyal to the outcomes. On the other hand, if you deal poorly with any of these five core concerns, all I can say is, watch out. Because <laughs> you have just created an adversary, an enemy in the negotiation. You're not going to get as much value out of that negotiation. So we're going to walk through each of these core concerns, some in more detail than others, as you are negotiating. So let's start with the first of these five core concerns. Appreciation is a core concern. None of us likes to feel not understood, devalued, unheard. But it's only been recently that science has really started to catch up with our common understanding of just how powerful this thing called appreciation actually is. Anybody in this room, on and on, there are cameras looking at the body language between the couple, the micro expressions on the face, the subtle movements of the muscles. You're sitting there with your spouse, and in walks a research assistant. You know, an 18 year old college student, you don't need to fight, just talk about that thing. Just a show of hands, how many of you recently have turned to your romantic partner and on a beautiful Saturday afternoon just said, hey honey, let's talk about a recent conflict. <laughs> Anybody? No? And did you do it? And then how did it go? A few months ago, it was a beautiful Saturday afternoon in Boston. I turned my, our kids were out. Why am I sharing this research with you? Because these researchers can predict with over 90% accuracy who stays married, who gets divorced, one year later, three, five, ten years down the road. They can predict, Valeria, whether you and your spouse will stay married ten years down the road based only on a short amount of interaction. One minute. One minute's worth of data is enough to predict whether they will stay married or not 10 years down the road. And guess what the primary predictor is of marital stability? What do you think allows for a stable marriage over time? What do you think it is? Say it And in fact, they have boiled this thing down to a ratio, to a number. Those couples who tend to stay together over time, as they are talking about their conflict situation, for every single negative thing that one says or feels, five positives. 
One to five. That's the magic number. People tend to stay together. So if you and I are you know, in a relationship and we are talking about a conflict, for every single negative, there tend to be five positives. Not verbal necessarily, but it's how I'm feeling. It's what I'm thinking, and so on. Two big humps of, of people. Some people stay married. That's one hump of people, one group of people. And they stay married, and when they are dealing with conflict, five to one, that's the ratio. As they're talking, there's a whole different clump of them. What ratio do you think predicts divorce? How many positives to how many negatives as they are talking about their conflict? What do you think? One to one. You say, why one to one? It's, it's an interesting theory. Why? Stay together, then one to four does the opposite. It turns out you're wrong. <laughs> uh, they found that most people who tend to get divorced, as they're talking about their conflict situation, for every single positive, one negative. You're right over here, sir. One to one. You know, for every positive, there's a negative. For every negative, there's a positive. Not necessarily in sequence, but in the aggregate, over time. And as I was studying this research, something is not with the negative. The problem is with the lack of positive. And this research has been replicated, not just in the marital context, but within the organizational context. And surprise, surprise, those organizations who tend to falter, means they absolutely have conflict. But the way that they deal with conflict is different. It's not all negative. It's five to one. That tends to predict more productive teamwork as well. And if appreciation is a core concern, you know, if this thing, as we are negotiating, helps us to get more information, helps us to build more loyalty to the relationship, the big question then, how do you do it? You know, how do you actually appreciate somebody as you are negotiating? And it's not as simple as people think. You know, I think most people think that if you is understanding the message that the other side is saying, $28. But is this appreciation? It doesn't feel like it is. It is trying to find merit, trying to find value in what the other side says or feels or thinks. And then thirdly, in some culturally appropriate way to communicate that understanding to the other side. This sounds easy. This sounds soft. But this is the essence of so much of the sales process of effective negotiation. He runs off into the janitor's closet. He locks the door behind him. And that's when the New York Police Department's hostage negotiation team, they arrive. They arrive about five minutes later. They are on pager. And as they get there, they hear on the other side of the door, this gentleman, the hostage taker, ranting and raving. If this child is an angel, I will love him. If this child is a demon, you know what I have to do. If this child is an angel, I will try the demon. And he's saying this again and again and again and again. If this child is an angel, I will love him. If this child is a demon, you know what I have to do. If this child is an angel, and on and on and on he goes. The hostage negotiators, they arrive and almost immediately start banging on the door. Open up, open up, what's going on in there? What is going on in there? And does this approach to negotiation work? What do you think, yes or no? Yes or no? no. Of course not. Because what are we, the hostage negotiators, failing to do? What are we failing to do at a fundamental level? What are we do, doing wrong? What are we doing, help me out. None of this. Is there any appreciation that we are doing? Are we trying at all to understand that other side? hostage negotiators said on the other side of the door. Don't worry, the child is an angel. And did it work? What do you think, yes or no? Yes, yes. What do you, yes or no? Yes. yes. Of course, not. <laughs> it did not work, this child is an angel. You said there were three people on the other side of the door. How many people are really on the other side of the door? And all of a sudden, initially we were at that door, we're banging on the door. There's no appreciation. 
And then five minutes later, and in real life several hours later, we're now saying, don't worry, the child is an angel, I know. We are over appreciating. We are assuming that we know more about what is going on in the mind of this hostage taker than he knows. And that is a dangerous place to be. And we were stuck. We were stuck and life was on the line. And then the team ultimately went back to the bare basics of effective negotiation. Two of the hardest and the simplest things in the world to do. Listening and asking good, open-ended questions. What do you want? How can we help you? Talk to us. And once we started to ask those kinds of questions, we started to learn. We started to learn this gentleman, he was not crazy from his perspective. He was trying to save the world. Save the world from the demons and bring in the good guys. And once we understood that, it completely changed our approach to the negotiation. Because now we could say to this hostage taker, look, I don't see the angels you see. And I don't see the demons you see. But I hear you say you are trying to save the world. And you know what, our own small way here at the New York Police Department, we are trying to save the world too. So why don't you open up that door and see if we can try and save this world together. And, and literally, three minutes later, that little door squeaks open, out walks that gentleman with baby in arms. But it is a challenge. You know, and a true challenge, how do you appreciate? You're sitting down to meet with the supplier not at that point in time. But I would argue that that is perhaps your most powerful tool, your stealth weapon as a negotiator. Appreciation. So let's move on to the make decisions without somebody else telling you what to do. So let's imagine that we have a very tight schedule today, but let us imagine. And what do you think I do based upon my feeling? And I'm not proud of this, but what do you think I did? I, I, she wasn't there yet, so I was screaming, but to myself, you know, uh, back to the way it was before, changing everything back. You know, and, and in my head it was, this is not your apartment, this is my apartment. Who gave you the, you know, this, this is the conversation in my mind. But Mia, she had a much better sense of style than I did. In other words, the room looked better the way she had designed it. So why am I changing the room back to the way it was before? It makes no logical sense. Why am I doing that? Because it is not about the content. It's about the process. You can spend days or weeks or months and you say to that supplier, here is the best deal you will ever get. <coughs> take it or leave it. Are they more likely to take it or to leave it? Leave it. And it has nothing to do with the content again. It has everything to do with the process as well. So how do you deal with this thing called autonomy? The simplest we've been able to boil it down, four English letters. A, C, B, D. Always consult before deciding. Always consult before deciding, especially around decisions that are important to that other side. Third, the third of our five core concerns is affiliation. What is that, affiliation? Is that, how do you say it in Portuguese? Uh, affiliation, in a negotiation. And just like these other core concerns, affiliation has a huge impact on process and on your out, ultimate outcome in your negotiation. Let's make this come to life. So if you don't mind right now, if everybody in this room, if you can have a sentence to try and better understand who is this other person sitting near you as a negotiator. So who are they as a negotiator? Is that there is no talking. <laughs> so from this point forward, no more talking. I need this other person and better understand who are they as a negotiator. Physical pain. When you feel physical pain, 
The part of your brain that tends to light up is called the anterior cingulate cortex. The anterior cingulate cortex. It's one of the primary pain centers of your brain. You know, somebody walks up to you on the streets of New York, and God forbid, they punch you in the stomach hard, boom! That part of your brain immediately lights up. Let's change the context now. Let us suppose now that you are in the midst of a negotiation. There are five of you at the negotiation table. It's a complex deal at a mall or elsewhere. You're the representative. Let's say that you, what's your first name? Fernanda. Fernanda? Let's say that you, Fernanda, you're one of those five at the table and the only woman. All the other four are men. What part of your brain tends to light up? The anterior cingulate cortex. The same part of your brain that experiences physical pain is the part of your brain that experiences the pain of rejection. And the impact on you is no different. It is like everybody else has walked up to you in that negotiation and punched you in the stomach. You can't focus. You're not there in the moment, and the problem is not just your problem. The problem is everybody's table. You get one point. And your business people, every single point is the equivalent of one million US dollars contributed by, oh yeah. <laughs> contributed by Marcos. <laughs> Here you go, you ready? One, two, three, go. <laughs> you have successfully humiliated me, thank you. <laughs> uh, so Rule number two, as you go to do this little uh, exercise for your arms, no talking, no nonverbal communication, and when I say go, because we're going to do this in a moment, right before I say go, I'm going to ask everybody to close your eyes. Close your eyes so you can fully concentrate only on this exercise and nothing else. That's the deal, to get as many points for yourself as you can. So find a partner at your table, everybody do this, please. What do you think they did? Exactly. 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 9, 10. It's much more efficient. You know? And they walk away with some 50, 60 million dollars each. You know, you really would have been in trouble, Mark. Yeah. Um, what's the point? You know, how does this connect to negotiation? It is win-win. The single most deadly assumption in negotiation is to walk in and to assume that it is an adversarial game. That it is me versus you. Retailer versus supplier. Re uh, store versus customer. The single most powerful shift you can make is in your mind. Shifting it so that it is no longer me versus you, but it's the two of us sitting side by side facing the same shared problem. The two-minute version, it deserves much more. But there was a long-standing conflict, as many of you know, between Ecuador and Peru. Largely over, the, it was over the border between the two countries. Don't walk in and say, look, this is my position on the land. What's your position? Our advice was, ask advice. President Fujimori, you've been a president for eight years. I've been a president for eight days. Practically speaking, what is your advice on how we can deal with this conflict more effectively together? I want a picture of you and President Fujimori. And President Mahwad said, oh, that's nice. You know, we'll get a nice stately picture of the two of us shaking hands. And Professor Fisher said, no, that's not the kind of picture I want. I want a picture of the two of you sitting side by side, pads of paper in hand, working together so that your constituencies, the employees in a sense, can see that you are no longer working against one another. You're now working side by side. You're right. And this picture had a dramatic impact on the entire peace process. Because the people now saw we are no longer working against one another. We are now working side by side. Status is about who's up and who's down. You know, if you're walking into a meeting with a supplier, and that supplier walks in and says, uh, hello, may I have your hand? 
Uh, yeah, very nice to meet you. <laughs> the deal is not going to go anywhere. It has nothing to do with the content. There's a status problem. One side is feeling put down. So in short, how do you deal with status? Respect the status of the supplier where it's due, and make sure you get that respect as well. And then the final of these five core concerns are you playing in your negotiation. We all play many different roles. Some of, us, some of us are the talkers, others the listeners, the relationship builders, the problem solvers. What role do you tend to play as you are negotiating with a supplier or somebody else? And is that role the most useful role you could be playing? You can play many different roles. Think in advance, what role makes most sense for me to play in this negotiation? So in short, let me close our <coughs> Point number one, reason is incredibly important. I am not at all arguing you should be completely emotional, but what I am saying is just as important as rationality is dealing with emotionality. How do you do that when it is so complicated? My suggestion, turn your attention to five simple core concerns. The next time you get into a fight with your spouse, or right before you go into your next big business negotiation, walk through these five core concerns. How do I better respect the other's autonomy? How do I better respect their status, their affiliation, help invite them into a more fulfilling role? And most important, how do I express appreciation most effectively? So with that, let me just say it is a tremendous honor and a true privilege and, pri privilege and pleasure to have this opportunity to talk with all of you. I am terrible with goodbyes, so let me hope that this is just a beginning. Please keep in touch. Truly an honor. Thank you so very much. Amen. Thank you.